Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zcast Caravalo from Zk Research, and I'm here in San Francisco at RSA 2025. Uh, actually, I'm not really at RSA. I'm at the Veeam Hospitality Suite, whatever you want to call it, yeah. near RSA. We're near it. Yeah, so it's all greened up. I'm with Dave Russell, uh, SVP of Strategy for Veeam. Yep. Uh, Dave, how you been? Yeah, good. You know, it was good to see you. Yeah, two it's weeks been a week. In a row. Yeah. yeah, it's been a week Cold since I've California, seen you. California, right? Yeah. San Diego at our event, and then here, San Francisco at RSA, like you mentioned. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting that. Uh, we are here at a security show, yeah. right? We're, I was at Vimon last week, and a lot of that historically has been about uh, data resilience and back, back home recovery, but clearly these two worlds are colliding, right? Yeah. And uh, I think one of the um, interesting aspects of Veeam's strategy has been thinking more and more about how you play in the world of cyber. You have all this data that companies hold, you, you back it up, and. Uh, what everybody tells you about AI, of course, is that you know data is in oil. And so, what is, now that you have all this data, what are, what are some of the things you're thinking about doing, helping your customers in different ways than you have in the past? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things I like to always point out from right from the get-go, all the bad things that can go wrong in the data center, they still go wrong in the data center. Maybe with a little less frequency, but you know, because we're at RSA, if we think about the world's largest IT outage to date. And not to pick on anyone, but it was the CrowdStrike incident yeah. last June. That was not cyber related. That no, was, that was a, <laughs> that was the irony of that. Error, right? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it just goes to show you that we absolutely have to protect ourselves from bad actors. But we also have to protect ourselves from humans that make mistake, equipment that fails. So those things still demand data resilience. But to your point, the evolution of that. If it's important enough to protect, what else can you do? Recovering yeah. from incident, of course, has value. But if it's critical data, as you mentioned, can we leverage that for additional insights? One of the things that we demonstrated last week at Beamon was tapping into a backup repository to start to do interesting kinds of questions, natural language processing, to be able to interrogate the RM365 repository, as the example we showed on stage where you could now get additional value out of something without impacting production. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's economic benefits to what you're doing, the security benefits, like for instance, um, you could look at the data and find indications of compromise, Yes. right? But is that something that you as a vendor historically, that's not a cyber vendor, should do, or is it data that you should pass on to one of your security partners, or is it a little bit of both? Wow, it's a great yeah. the first one that's actually picked up on that, and I think you nailed it with a little bit of both. So let me decompose that. We're in no way trying to recast ourselves as a cyber vendor. We're here at RSA for the last three years now because we think resiliency has a role to play in security. I would also, though, tell you everybody in the data center has a role to play in security. Yeah. But from that perspective, we actually can, in some cases, go and uncover things in the backup stream that the security tools didn't catch. And it's not because the tooling's wrong, it's because they only have milliseconds to triage packets that flow through it. We can take just a few more cycles and go a little bit deeper on the inspection. So should it be one or the other or both? Both, because the tools still matter, perimeter defense still matters, yep. even though everybody says we've moved as an industry beyond that threat, you're still going to have perimeter it's still, it's security. still an awful lot about it, a lot of perimeter security being sold. So. Ex yeah, well, yeah. Exactly yeah. for good reason, yeah. I would say. But while we want to have bi-directional communication, and now we're up to 65 different security integrations that we've got, we want to be able to tip to an organization's preferred security supplier, ah, we've detected something, and vice versa. If they've detected something, we can take some action as well. So I think it's a case of hopefully one plus one equals three. I kind of liken it to the notion of like a neighborhood watch. Yeah. It's good for everybody to be looking out. Yeah. Now, in theory, though, companies spend a lot of money on their SIMs and SOAR tools and things like that. Uh, if you do what you do best, which is looking at data and understanding the anomalies in it, you could actually make those products more efficient, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a feedback loop yeah. that absolutely can be present, and we're starting to explore more and more of that. We announced some updates last week, including CrowdStrike. So since I mentioned them yeah. in one thing, it's only fair to mention them in another, which is fantastic tool set, market leader. We want to integrate with them as well as other tools as well. And want to be able to share the views that we see. Again, I'm not saying we're security experts, but we handle the data. Typically, we handle the most important data in the organization. That's why they're protecting it. And we've got another vantage point. And we can take a little more resource to go and inspect that 
and to be able to comment on that. And then on the recovery side, maybe you're recovering data a few days old, we can make sure we can leverage the new latest signatures from some of those tools to ensure you're not reinfected. So there's yeah. a very symbiotic relationship. Yeah, that's always been a big problem with companies, right, is they, uh, they, they recover infected data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's this double-edged sword, right, because it's like disaster recovery. People are afraid to issue a disaster or declare a disaster and fail over. At the same time, in some cases, the act of trying to do something that should be restorative actually shoots them in the foot. To your point, they reinfect themselves. Yeah, and does does uh, this rise in AI act as a tipping point for re companies to rethink their data strategies as to how it relates to its cyber strategy? I think absolutely, and multiple vectors. One is you know you can use any tool for good or for harm. AI absolutely can be used to try to weaponize bad actors' intentions, either the data itself or the behaviors that they're exhibiting. But conversely, we're using AI to detect anomalies in line. We're looking at entropy as we ingest the data. So you've got to try to stay one step ahead of the latest. Yeah, and I think um, there's just so much data being generated today that if you're trying to, if you don't use AI to look at it, I'm not sure that there's any other way, right? It's really yeah. difficult, and that was where our, our AI example of, I sort of refer to it as find a needle in a haystack, yeah. right? That having the information is absolutely beneficial. Now we're on to the next step of those. How do you get the right information rapidly to the right person yeah. or tool? It might, not, it might be a pipeline, right? It might be to another tool. Yeah, and what are, uh, so non-cyber, what are some of the other things you're thinking about? Like you could actually help companies understand how to cost optimize storage, yep. you know, what apps to use, what not to use, things like that, right? There's there's yeah. a lot of different things you could do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, if you think about cost optimization, that's something that never goes out of favor, yeah. right? So looking at, are there applications, entire virtual machines, are there files that may be important enough to retain, just you don't want to retain them on your highest tier of storage or your highest availability on the cloud. So commenting on that, while still or appropriate making copies or maybe even making multiple copies, but doing that in a more economical manner. We've got intelligence baked in on a number of our solutions to do that, and there's more to come in terms of how we can actually advise the business, not just the backup administrator, but the rest of the business on how to optimize that. Okay, and um, uh, I want to pivot a little bit. One of the, I think, the notable things you do every VMON that I like is the ransomware report. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's a really interesting report because uh, well, it doesn't seem like we're making any progress. <laughs> despite, yeah. it, although it did show a little bit of progress we made this year, right? Yes. Uh, until yeah. you drill down a couple of levels. So yeah. what were some of the highlights for you from that report? Well, so, you know, the takeaway, yeah. like you mentioned, is, you know, it's still a threat, yeah. right? So we still have that exposure. The positive... Well, and a significant threat, not just yes. a threat, but yeah. Yeah. Right, I, I'm old enough to remember when people would worry about disaster recovery and the analogy they would use or the phrase they would use is if the airplane hits the bunker, the data center. Obviously, that's an extremely low probability yeah. event. Nowadays, what you have to worry about is the highest probability event of a major outage is going to be cyber, even though these other things do happen, that, such as a misconfiguration, etc. So one of the interesting things on the, the report was dwell time decreasing after a significant number of years being hearing that bad actors are in there and trying to move laterally. No, what we're seeing is more the smash and grab tactic. Yeah. Uh, also, less encryption. It's very popular in San Francisco, too. I know, I thought yeah. about that as I mentioned that. You know, the geography kind yeah, of played yeah. into that. And, but the analogy is true. Yeah, yeah. It's not, I'm not trying to stay in there for months or even Now, is it year. because they're able to find things faster also? They are, yeah. they're able to find things fast and the ability to try to monetize that very quickly. It's a risk and reward, I hate to say it, but it is a business. It's a risk and reward. How can I get in very rapidly, try to extort payment, and why stay there longer than you have to with run the risk of being caught when you can make some relatively easy money quickly. Okay, and then um, I think the other, uh, one of the other data points that I saw in there is that um, we are, we have made a small amount of progress, right? The number, I think, the total number uh, or companies affected actually went down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the hit rates going down, yeah. dwell times are also going down. Yeah. The request for ransom is decreasing. The request for payment is decreasing, yeah. meaning the dollar is transacted. But I think that's your more your smash and grab thing, right? That's yeah. exactly it. I think it's more. It's a higher number of smaller events versus the big bang event that we used to hear a little bit more of in the press. Yeah, and I. But I do think also the data point 
that held true was that if you pay, you're going to get hit again, and it doesn't yes. always guarantee you're getting your data back. No, both of those are hugely great points to mention, which is you know, there's, there's better than a one-third chance if you pay you're not getting the data back, and there's even a much more significant chance if you pay once, that name, that payment, meaning your company name, is yeah. going to be put on the dark web. It's not just that one actor that's coming back. It, the thieves are going to share amongst themselves, essentially. You become increasingly even more of a target. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's combine the two discussions, right? You've got all this data. Um, there's this uh, looming threat out there of ransomware that probably is the most likely thing to happen to you from a data recovery standpoint. How do companies protect themselves? Give a couple of pieces of advice. Yeah, well, here's a really good one that I would say is, I like to think of, I'll call it data hygiene. Data resilience or data hygiene doesn't have to incur substantial extra activity or cost. Meaning, if you're protecting data and you're doing it appropriately, using things like immutability, meaning the data can't be encrypted, can't be deleted. Also, if you're encrypting that yourself so it can't be exfiltrated, now the common smash and grab is, you still have a copy of your data, I didn't encrypt it, but I sold it to somebody else. I may have even sold it to multiple other people. So if I just pause on that point, two things you can do right away, make sure you've got one or more copies, ideally more than one, make sure it's immutable, so you can't be encrypted, and then make sure you've been the one to encrypt it. Our colleague Rick Vanover likes to say, encrypt your data or someone else will. Yeah. <laughs> so those, those are two key things right off the bat. The other is leverage the investments you've already made. This is why another reason why I say it's of no additional cost potentially. Again, 65 integrations with security vendors within me, more we announced last week. We want to go integrate with the tool set you've already deployed so it's not do more, do more, do more. You know, the company is generally in the business of doing something else. All of this data is generally a byproduct of trying to achieve a different business means. We want to support that, not add more layers on top. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting at your event too, the, one of your big demos was with M365. Yep. And I think when I talked to the customers at Vmon, uh, I'd say this is the first year there was much broader realization that just because you're in the cloud doesn't necessarily mean your data is secure too. And I think that actually has become something that you've talked about for a while, the Veeam has talked about, but I don't think customers fully realize, but it seems like that became a reality this year. I think it did. Yeah. And I give actually Microsoft a lot of credit for that as well. They made, well, not only a minority investment within Veeam, but they have also signed up to help sell our M365 yeah. protection solution. And it's not because their infrastructure is not going to be stable and available. It's because people can make configuration errors, people can leave ports open, bad actors can get in. There's an occasional internal rogue actor as well. All those things can happen. So you need additional layers of capability and security. If it's important enough, for you, it's probably important enough for someone to go after. All right, Dave, well, we're here at RSA. More data, more security threats, uh, and uh, I guess more ransom are coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. we're gonna have a couple more things to talk about next year as yeah. well, but we're, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve. And again, we wanna make sure we can democratize that so that every organization can have the tools that they need to get done what they're really in the business of doing. Yeah, well, and that's, uh, that's a big win for everyone, so yeah, here, thanks. Here. Anything you wanna add? No, just thanks to everyone. Check out Veeam.com, some of the data we've mentioned, as well as some of the capabilities yeah. we have. And I'll, uh, I'll toss a link to the ransomware report in the YouTube description below as well. Ah, brilliant. Okay, good. Thank you. All Always right. good to see you. Okay, good. And so on behalf of Dave Russell from the Veeam suite at RSA, I'm CS Care of Alton ZK Richards, and thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time on the next episode of Zcast. Thanks, Dave.